And welcome back to Cottage Talk. I'm Russ Goldman. Joining me right now is Dan Crawford from HamiN.com and the Green Pole Podcast. This is our match reaction show where we're going to look back at Fulham's journey in the Carabao Cup semifinal. Unfortunately, it ends, and we'll talk about that in this show. At the end of the show, Dan and I will talk a little bit about the upcoming FA Cup match against Newcastle United. As always, please do subscribe on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. It does help other phone supporters find us. Okay, Mr. Crawford, how you doing? How you feeling yeah. today, a, a couple of days later? How you feeling? I'd be lying if I wasn't still a bit sore about it, but, you know, it's fun, isn't it? If we wanted to win things, we'd support another team. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's funny, Dan, because I'm asked all the time, still to this day, why do you support Fulham? It would have been easier, right, to follow a team like Manchester United. I'm not going to even mention that other team locally. I'm not going to go you better there. Not. You better not. No, I'll be, no. I'll be leaving. Good. <laughs> but it would be easier. But it's so fulfilling following and being a supporter of a club like Fulham. And uh, it's in my blood. It's been in your blood for a very, very long time. So nights like this happen. But we can talk about it and we can move on. Whereas, you know, this show is not a Liverpool show, so they can focus all they want on getting to the final and Jurgen Klopp. I could give a flying hoot right now about Jurgen Klopp, okay? So if you're looking for talk on Jurgen Klopp, do that on your own time. We're not doing that on this show. We're going to focus on Fulham because it's a Fulham show, Dan. So... I just want to get your opening thoughts on the match, and then we'll talk a little bit about your thoughts on the starting level. And I also want to talk about the atmosphere at Craven Cottage. But let's just get your opening thoughts on what you watched in the second leg, an unfortunate end for Fulham. Well, I mean, just to say, I do think it's fitting that we got a draw against Liverpool and pushed them all the way and... The guy I'm not supposed to mention said, "You know what? Well, that's enough of me being a manager. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna go somewhere else." Um, look, we are a, a few days on, and it, you just think, "What if? What if this? What if that? Possibly." Oh, it's interesting. We spoke about this a um, couple of days ago, didn't we? In the immediate yeah. aftermath of the game, and there seems to be a divide amongst people in, and how people assess this performance as much as anything. And I can see where the element of people who say that wasn't, you know, it's a semi-final, we don't get to semi-finals, once in a lifetime chance to, you know, lift a trophy. Um, and we should have been more up for it. We should have been more uh, aggressive. And all I would say to that is, I think Liverpool could have blown us away and we'd have been gone. In The, the game would have been over. And I was worried about that being the case anyway. Um, that being said, sorry, I'm, I'm massively um, meandering here. Um, that being said, I did, you do have to kind of take into consideration the calibre of the opposition. And it you you would have got a greater sense of this from... from um, watching on television but Liverpool went into a huddle when it looked like um, Van Dijk was doing a lot of talking and they came out they meant business they were like well you know if we score they probably aren't going to come back and uh, you know we can kill the game off we score another one that's it you know and they came out and meant business and part of me is well we're already getting into the match of the review of the game we're going to get there gonna do. so Look, I, but my overwhelming sense was one of pride. Yeah, it wasn't a quality performance, but it wasn't a quality performance. Liverpool are top of the Premier League and they've got an outstanding forward line. And we weren't at the races. The first half, probably one of the poorest 45 minutes we've seen for a while in terms of um, being on the front foot and playing like we know we can. But that is because of how Liverpool... Um, did things that we couldn't live with the high press, we couldn't get out, we didn't have a, a runner in beyond their their uh defense or even someone who could 
get the ball further up the pitch. Um, and I, I, I thought it was going to be a very long and rather um, forgettable semi-final. Uh, and then we came back into it. But I guess you, my, 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 my think, thinking on it is that if we'd have gone all guns blazing from the get-go, you could have found yourself way behind on aggregate. And I think it was more about trying to stay in the game. And, of course, we conceded, well, I don't really know, like, the type of goal that only Fulham can, can concede, you know, <laughs> right. a, double, a double deflection. and Double deflection. Yeah, and, and still, and Bernd Leno, you know, he's human after all. Um, yeah. And, and you just wonder, frankly, if you had a bit, if you had, if you had a deeper squad, if you had some people to bring off the bench to, you know, Harry Wilson was fantastic, and who knew Issa Diop was the answer up front, Russ? I mean, that's the revelation of the evening. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, good stuff there, Dan. I just want to just share my opening thoughts, and then we'll really get into this. And uh, I'm glad that you brought us to talking about pride because that was my first thought. Was I was feeling proud of. Fulham Football Club for getting to a semifinal, for giving it such a really strong go as they did against Liverpool. I'm glad that you brought up the fact that the approach was probably the right approach. Right after the match, I actually called into Sirius XMFC, spoke to Eric Winalda and Jason Davis, and I basically said that I thought Fulham should have been more aggressive. Well, Eric Winalda, just like you said, well, maybe that would – not have been the right approach then that basically he thought they both thought that actually Marco Silva got it right, set them up right. And you are dealing with one of the best teams in the world right now in Liverpool. So if you go out too aggressive, you're going to leave yourself wide open to get hurt even worse than they probably were. So Marco probably tried to find the happy medium. Unfortunately, there was a double deflection and the goal goes in. What are you going to do at that point? You just got to keep on going forward and, and hoping that you get the goal then hopefully get a second goal. We got one goal. We did not get two. But my first reaction was they weren't aggressive enough. But now looking back at it a couple of days later, I have to give Marco Boa and the players a lot of credit. I think they actually looked at it the right way the way the match played out was just not the way that you were hoping it was going to. They got the goal first and everything changes after that. If Fulham got the goal first, maybe things would have been different, Dan. But when I look at it, I go back to, like I said, pride. I've seen a lot of negative comments after the match. I understand the disappointment and uh, I respect it. I respect the missed opportunity that some fans are thinking. And uh, I'm looking at it a little bit differently. And we all have our own opinions. I look at it in a prideful manner because Fulham got to a semifinal. Maybe next time they'll actually get to a final. I see it as maybe a progression up the ladder to then being able to get to ultimately maybe winning a cup, which would be fantastic. A piece of silverware. That would be not a piece of silverware. Silverware. It would be great. So that's the ultimate goal. And we keep getting closer. Is it a disappointment? Of course it is. But I can't look at this run and say, you know what? Uh, I'm really upset. They blew it. I, I just don't look at it that way, Dan. I, I guess I'm not wired that way. I look at it in a prideful manner. Yeah, I, I guess the, 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 the other view is we, we – we, You've got a Marco Silva wants to change the culture uh, at the football club and, and write a new chapter. And he's all about he talks very much about history and so do a lot of the players and and, and and taking the club to the next level. And I guess if you're really ambitious, you know you don't care about making a semi final. I I understand. I you know we'd never made a League Cup semi final, but. You know there are no medals for that. You don't get a trophy for for being in the in the semi-finals, and that's where you know we. It's a huge ask for Fulham to leap into that contention, um, and we weren't able to to do it. And I think there there is something here. I don't think Silver 
Mike wanted his players to miss pass, so, misplay so many passes in the first 20 minutes or look a little overawed by the occasion. But he made a point in his comments afterwards uh, to the written press that several of his players, you know, it was their first taste of a, of a game of that magnitude. Yes, they played in playoff semi-finals, but um, we, we did look a little bit uh, taken aback by it all. And to people who I didn't expect, you know, uh, Anthony Robinson, as much as we both love him, I think, uh, Russ, um, both of us, I think, for different reasons, um, but he didn't have his best game. And I, I think he would admit that. Certainly not his best first 45 minutes. And indeed, the goal, inadvertently, the Liverpool goal, inadvertently comes from Robinson absolutely whacking the ball into Tom Kearney's midriff. And Tom Kearney is really winded by it. And that puts us out of position. And I just thought, but you, you, you made the point, if Fulham had scored the first goal, you know, if my aunt had, you know, so-and-so, it, 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 she'd be different. Um, but if Shao Polina had placed that volley from the, oh. from, from the corner rather than going for pure power and it had dropped in, I think it would have been a very different game. And, and you have to kind of make your peace with those moments where I think we were where we let ourselves down is in the concession of that, that first goal. I, they, they clearly felt Liverpool that they could work those diagonal balls. Um, Diaz is good in the air. Castagna less so. And he goes to compete for the ball in an area where you can't get beaten and you certainly can't isolate yourself. He gets beaten and then, well, well you've seen it on everyone listening to this podcast would have seen would have seen what happened right um but but it was right in front of me and i could see that it took it hit Polina's there doing what he does putting his foot in the other week we were celebrating because he made a stupendous block to block tackle to deny bakaya saka didn't he against arsenal At this time he's in there in the last ditch and it hits him i think it go it hits tosin <laughs> then it hits Leno, who, who's going the other way. It hits the post, possibly, but it squirms in. And, you know, it's just that sinking feeling. Um, yeah. But in fairness, we, we, we came back from it well. You know, I, I did worry about whether the game was going to get away from us, even in the second half, whether whether we'd be able to have a spell of pressure. And we did. Absolutely. And we, you know, so there's plenty to take from it. And I think that's the where where we have to be. I did like what Silva said. We'll be stronger for this experience. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, but you, you, you're left wondering. Um, I, I mean, to take your point of progression, you know, FA Cup quarterfinal last year, we all know what happened. Semi-final, having beaten a number of Premier League teams along the way. Tottenham, who hadn't lost before then. You know, Everton, who lost a bit, a bit more, more regularly. Both of those on penalty shootouts, which in itself is huge progress. Um, and to lose to the, you know, genuine title contenders, whatever we say about what's happened today, um, genuine title contenders and, and looking really good across the piece, to lose by one goal when you look at those games and there are moments in both of those games where with a bit more game management, with a bit more smarts, maybe arguably with a substitution here or there or a different yeah. selection, it's a different outcome. Certainly if you'd had, if, it, if Marco Silva had had the sort of investment that perhaps we were expecting and maybe he was expecting in the summer, you know, maybe he'd have had another centre forward. Maybe he'd have had someone to bring on, um, or even if Adama Traore hadn't kept injuring his hamstring. You know, don't, don't, those little things. But, hey, what can you do? No, I hear you, Dan. And uh, one final thing, because I wanted to talk a little bit about the nerves, because I think that Fulham felt those nerves and really showed it in the first half. But I'm glad that Silva talked a little bit about it. It's almost like I'm watching a lot of tennis because my son now, and 
say you're playing Novak Djokovic for the first time, you're going to be a little bit nervous. Whereas he's done it over and over again in all these matches, he's going to be more natural. And, and if you look at going into a semifinal against Liverpool, been there, done that, they are more relaxed. They were the more relaxed team. Fulham were probably just a little bit nervous, and I think it's understandable. And I'm glad that you mentioned this. I believe the players will learn from this, will take something out of it to potentially progress forward to the next step and the next step. Those are the positives to take out of this. So, yes, I did think they showed their nerves, but I think that in the end, in maybe a year or two, we're going to reap the rewards of losing a match like this to Liverpool. That's the way I'm looking at it. Okay, Dan, let's talk about, before we talk about the uh, starting 11, I want to ask you about that. I want to ask you about the atmosphere at Craven Cottage, and then we're going to talk a little bit later about what we expect the atmosphere to be for the FA Cup match. But let's talk about the atmosphere on Wednesday night. You were there. It looked magical. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think I mentioned it to you. Um, I, I, I got into the ground very early. Um, about about six o'clock because uh, I was meeting somebody and um, I wanted to make sure I got in and, and sampled said atmosphere. But I was one of the first people into the ground, um, and I got a bit of a shock because they'd laid these uh, flags on the on the seats. And as I looked up to the Johnny Haynes stand, it looked like something out of I don't know nineteen seventies Mississippi. I, we're not going to go there, but with a white flags in the top of the Johnny Haynes stand looked like some sort of um, well, KKK convention or something and that, uh, that it was just an unfortunate angle um, for me to be sitting at. As I looked up, I was like, am I hallucinating here? If I, you know, has somebody slipped me a substance during the course of the day in my drink or something? Is that really happening? Um, and they did bring back the clappers um, I, I do think whoever decided that everybody needed a clapper um, should be fired uh, because we've done fine without those. And that might be what jinxed it. Um, Maybe. Not not that I'm, you know, superstitious or anything like that. Um, the atmosphere was incredible. Um, and yes, you had a nice uh, flag waving display that looked good for the cameras, but Actually, you know, Marco Silva made a point of saying, we need an atmosphere, you need to stick with the team. And the fans did. Um, and it shows that we can create an atmosphere. Now, Craven Cottage, not one of the, not known for its loudness. And I actually thought, you know, we got the test of, is a referee influenced by the partisan nature of a Fulham crowd when it's up? And the answer is no, because I, I just I know I'm not I know we're not in this section, but I've never seen like Tom Kearney getting booked for playing a pass and McAllister running into him. That was ridiculous. Is is possibly one of your one of my our, our friends, a, a good listener to the show, one of my one one of my one of my group um, uh, called Gavin. Uh, so my group, some people who uh, come to the games with me and we meet for a drink afterwards. He was watching on uh, on television, unfortunately. He couldn't uh, be at the match, but couldn't get a ticket. But uh, he, he said he'd never seen anything like that in like professional years, decades of watching professional football. And I just wanted to say, that's the test of like people say, oh, maybe we're a bit quiet. Maybe we don't make much noise. I, I did think it was very curious that, that um, uh, the referee appeared to only be booking Fulham players until he booked uh, Kelleher very late on. That's um, right. And that there are a lot of spicy challenges that were just allowed to to go on. Um, but no, the atmosphere was great. Um, it, it was one of the special nights. Unfortunately, we couldn't get the team over the line. But um, we. Aside from the, you know, some of the chaos trying to get into the ground um, for some people, and I understand that was quite severe um, outside the ground. And there are a few neg negative headlines around the club, but 
Um, the fans were 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 superb, and I, I, I'm sure the players. Well, I know um, the players were very appreciative of that. And Marco referenced it. Um, it was a special night, and uh, yeah, uh, it was great to great to be there. And I hope it came across on the on the television that, that um, the fans were right behind. You know, for the international fans, I mean, how did it sound, Russ? Did it sound different to what? normally you hear or don't hear was the case well, for me honestly it did sound different it sounded it reminded me and i'm gonna go there to those europa league matches that's what it reminded me of it reminded me of that totally so i had that feel and uh i knew that the supporters were behind phone they're always behind phone but there was this extra little feeling with this match and it really it came across it came across so I, but so can i ask you a question it's an sure. interesting topic that do you know the fulham players some of them were trying to rev up the crowd and i felt it's interesting that you mentioned um the europa league run because it, uh, it's um the anniversary of clint dempsey's hat trick against newcastle today isn't it um but i thought somebody like clint dempsey would have just thundered into a tackle and like uh, got the crowd going, you know, or chased the right. ball, you know, chased the ball. He had no right to win, or knowing Clint, like push somebody about thirty yards instead of Johnny Haynes stand, or you know, something like that. And it would have just got the crowd up. Um, and we didn't really have that for a while. No, no. Um, but yeah, I, it was Clint who was in my mind for that. Because, you know, you knew he was a competitor and he had that way of getting everybody behind him. Well, Dan, I have my thoughts on why you didn't get that. And I think a lot has to do with uh, giving up that goal. And we'll talk about it. Because once Fulham scored the goal, everything changed. You will admit that. At that point, I've heard a lot of commentary that maybe – it didn't look like Fulham were going to score, but I felt a little bit different. I felt after that goal that they were going to give it a goal, but Liverpool changed their tactics to their credit and saw the match out. We'll get there, but let's talk about before we go delve more into the match. I just want to just get your thoughts on this. I actually got the starting 11 right on my preview. I got it completely right. So, but here's the question for you, because this is what I was going back and forth with. Really, the decision for me was Tom Kearney versus Harrison Reed. I wanted Tom Kearney because I thought that would give us the outlet to get to the ball wide. He would be the facilitator. So for me, I thought that was necessary. You would be giving something up if you brought in Harrison Reed. You wouldn't have that bite. Did they need more of a bite against Liverpool? Maybe. Did Marco get the starting 11 right, Dan? Well, I'm going to th- I mean, it was, it was roughly the starting 11 I would have picked, frankly. I'm the same as you. I'd have gone Kenny over Reed. But what I might have done is dropped Andreas either altogether or okay. or put or played with a more conventional three in midfield. Maybe Polina as a whole more deeper lying. And then you could have played Reed and Kearney. Kearney. Just to give you an extra body in the middle of the, in the, actually in the middle of the pitch, because you know Liverpool did dominate. Gravenberg, he likes to get about. He's got some engine on him. Um, McAllister, well, I won't. I, we've already mentioned him and his yep. histrionics. Um, I have to say, some lad called Elliot had quite a good game. He did. Um, he actually he, did. But. Um, he, we're, you know, we're fortunate that he was obviously um, not paying attention when they taught finishing skills at Motspur Park all those years ago because he, he, I worried that he was going to score. Um, he had an air shot right at the beginning and then in the second half, seemingly, sh- I think he should have scored there and Leonard yeah. makes, a, makes a good save. The one, the, the two areas that, would pro- provoke most debate for me in that starting eleven were do you go Castagna or Tete? Right. And Castagna has earned the shirt, but he may find himself under pressure now because you know Tete is a big has proven himself as a big game performer for Fulham. Um you can't you can't argue about that. So you you're lucky that you've got two high quality 
right backs. But I don't think Tete would have been beaten aerially like that. Again, it's a lot of after, uh, what do you call it? Monday morning quarterbacking in your, your, uh, your That's what we call it. Yeah, yep. I thought uh, there's a lot of that. The one that's exercised the most debate, I think, is Deckel Dover Reed or Harry Wilson. That's a good one too. Yeah, because um, Bobby, it, it was it wasn't his best hour, um, and he'd already caught quite a lot of fire for the uh, in, in the first leg. And I would just say, you know, Deckel Dover Reed's a trier. He works very hard. He's picked for defensive. Solidity, I think, a lot of the time. Right. And we were in the game, still in the game. And Wilson came on and exploit and exploited some tired legs and, and and looked really good. Could he have done it from the start? I love Harry Wilson. I'm a big fan of his, but even Harry would admit probably that he hasn't been as consistent over the course of his um Fulham career. There's a there's an issue, of course, with injuries for, for Harry. He had a bad injury start of last season. Um, but he did well for the for the goal, and we'll, we'll, we'll get there as well. Um, it's much of a muchness, really. You can, it's not like football manager or one of these games where you can, you know, you, you can turn the computer off and have another go, I guess. that You get one chance of setting, setting this out and... I can see why Marco did it. Did he get the starting eleven right? Well, no, because we didn't go through. But I mean, that's quite harsh, really, when you think of all that Marco Silva's done and what he's working with. Sure, I think he probably deserves a bit of appreciation. Oh, than absolutely, Dan. Absolutely, yeah. Dan. All right. So listen, we've already talked already about the goal from. Liverpool. So I don't want to go into more detail on that. And both both say that uh, Liverpool really, after that, really were in control. Fulham had a really hard time just doing pretty much anything at that point. As we get to the second half, I think it actually got worse, Dan, to start the second half where Fulham couldn't get out. I mean, I remember early on in the second half, I'm like, this is not going to end well. And they were really starting to get the pressure on Fulham big time. Like you said, there were opportunities for them to get that goal, to really put the uh, the tie away, to really just end it. They didn't. They kept Fulham in the match. Fulham stayed in the match. For all you want to say about Fulham and, and how they played in this match, they were in it. And then, Dan, I, I don't want to waste any more time. Let's talk about the goal. And I'm glad that you mentioned Harry Wilson because I think he changed the match. I think him coming on was a, a change. And he was involved, obviously, in, in the goal for with uh, Issa Diop. So let's talk about this, and then we'll talk about afterwards. Because there was still a decent amount of time to score that next goal that would have gotten Fulham into extra time. They didn't get it. But this goal, I thought, just it probably caused Craven Cottage to erupt. I'm assuming it certainly felt like that watching the match. Thoughts on the goal from Fulham? Yeah, just before that, Russ, sorry to uh, completely yeah, go ahead. Dis disobey you. Um, we, I mean, we did have some chances in the first half, even though we were right up against it. And then, well, you know, I was surprised you pressed fast forward on the <laughs> entire second half. <laughs> um, you know, let, let's have a little mention for uh, Tosin gets his head to one. And yeah. the goalkeeper and Pereira sort of stabs it from a very tight angle. I should have the went there, Dan. You know, but then, but he, and we built up a head of steam at several points. And I, I would just say we had to be brave with the ball, and that did involve taking some risks at the back of uh, close to our own goal, um, for sure. And I know that gives people palpitations, um, in uh, <laughs> in every sense, but I, I would just say some of the link up play, the way Kenny was shielding the ball. Excellent. The goal, beautiful link up down that left hand side. Wilson does uh, magnificently well. <laughs> and, and for the second time in the evening, it felt like I was hallucinating because there was Issa Diop. Maybe Issa Diop is the, is the answer as a centre forward, Russ. You know, 
perhaps he's the man. We all laughed when we put him up there against West Ham and I mean, then didn't. I know. Didn't was it or was it that? No, but I think that might have been Duffy. Um, there was a game certainly <laughs> where we put put Issa Diop up there and it, and then didn't get him the ball. Um, but this he finished it really well. In fairness, like and and you're right. There was like a, a not to go all Peter Jury on you, but a tidal wave on the Thames, and suddenly. The belief surged back and Wilson was suddenly bestriding through central midfield like a man possessed. And I, I did think that shot had gone through Kelleher. It nearly did. It did. That low, that low shot um, for about 25 yards out. And we put on a lot of pressure uh, following that. And, you know, at the end of the game, Jurgen Klopp puffed out his cheeks and went over and Spent some time talking to Marco, Louis Balmorte and uh, Stuart Gray. So, the, you know, we pushed them all the way. Um, and it's just one of those really bitter pools to swallow. But I think what impresses me is it seems as though they've they put it to one side. They put it in the memory bank to motivate them. And they're getting ready for Newcastle. So... That that's the impressive thing because you can't afford to dwell on something like right. that. It's it, it's gone now. Right, Dan. And listen, if you like, you really look at this, and we already talked about how we both feel pride after this match. And if you watch the end, I'm glad that you brought us back to the opportunities. You just talked about the Pereira one. How many posts? How many crossbars is this guy going to hit? But he continues to do it. And if he gets one in, things change in all sorts of matches, right? But you know what? They were creating some opportunities. There was that spell where Liverpool would, would not let Fulham out, but they kept coming. So that's a credit to Fulham. That's a credit to Marco. That's a credit to everyone that they didn't give up. They could have given up. They didn't give up. They hung in there and they got the goal, gave themselves a chance. And this isn't a moral victory. This is a stepping stone to better things. That's the way I'm looking at it. I'm a glass half full guy. I can't leave this with my head down. I'm leaving it up. And I'm sure the players have their heads up now and they got to move on. You have to have the blinders on. You got to move to the next step. We're on to Newcastle, as we would say here in New England with the Patriots. You're on to the next game. You're on to the next match. We're on to Newcastle. And we're going to talk about that coming up next. But before we do, Dan, who would you give man of the match to? Well, I think the two centre halves are um, a really good bet for it. Um, Diop was outstanding, not just because he scored the goal, but he was, he was excellent in defence. And I thought Tosin Adarabio, um was really good as well, notwithstanding that um, first goal, which is harsh to blame that those guys uh, for it, but. Yeah, I, I would say we we weathered a storm and and came into it. But a, but a shout for for Tom Kearney, not his most complete performance, but you can see why he was um, needed. And of course, I've overlooked. Can you give man of the match to someone who was only on the pitch for a short amount of time? Because clearly, the standout Fulham player was Harry Wilson. I would agree with that. I think you can, Dan, because he changed the game. If you have someone that can change the game, I would give it to Harry Wilson. I was actually listening to our friends on the phone in this show, and they were going back and forth talking about, about should is Harry better coming off the bench? Can he start? Jack Collins is making the argument, yes, he can start. He's had some good matches when he starts, but you can make the argument that he's better off the bench. But I think you can give him man of the match, Dan. Well, Jack Collins and I grew up well, – 200 metres from one another. So I'm well familiar that he likes an argument. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, well, I mean, what did, what was his view? Did he think Harry was better off the bench? Is that what he's trying to say? No, he was actually making the counter to that. He thinks that oh. Harry Wilson can be a starter and does not get enough credit for when he does start. That He's had some stinkers, but he's started well too. All right. So it was Samuel. <laughs> who, who was, who was uh, consigning uh, <laughs> consigning Harry to the bench? Okay, well, we can, I can pick that up with them later. Um, okay. Yeah. 
Go on, Mike. Okay, excellent, excellent, Dan. All right, coming up next, Dan and I are going to preview the Newcastle United match. Okay, Dan, before we do a quick preview of the Newcastle United match, I want to talk a little bit about and tell fans to go to BBC Sounds app. That's where I went, and I listened to you on BBC London, a great interview. Let's talk about what you were talking about with the host there. I forget his name. You'll tell me who the host is, and then we'll talk about this Newcastle United match. Oh, Andy is a great guy for BBC Radio London. Normally does the uh, Friday night uh, yep. uh, London sports show, which is an hour. Um, and it's the first time I've had a chance to to speak with him. And, I, you know, I wasn't enthusiastic when I received the call to ask, would you like to relive the devastation of Wednesday night? And then, as you all have heard, they played the commentary of the whole thing and you had to listen to the, you know, it's rather like being reminded of all the worst moments of your life right before you have to talk about them. But anyway, we got right. over it. And I guess... What you're asking me here is um, how up for the cup, the FA Cup, I am. And the answer is not very because the pricing, I don't want to go go, go too too heavy on this because we, it right. feels like we've done it to death. But I do feel like it is. So this game is on ITV. In this country, it's Saturday, 7 p.m., which is a disgraceful kickoff time, principally for the Newcastle fans who can't get a train home. Um, they're being, uh, we're, we're playing on a Saturday night when most people are, e are either in the pub having had several drinks or already during the course of the day or, or at home with their families or, or whatever. And we'd all make the effort. Because had we not got to the League Cup semi-final, you know, we'd be looking at the the uh, the draw with several all Premier League ties. I think it's five yeah. Premier League ties in this round. You know, you get through this one and dare I say it, with a favourable draw, you, you know, you're starting to think about going further in the, in, in the competition. And the, the, the two things about this... You know, for at forty pounds, they're pricing it higher, ten pounds higher than the Premier League cap for away fans, which is established for a number of years now at, uh, at thirty pounds. And you weren't even able to uh, reserve, have your season ticket seat reserved, and it just sort of smacked of like, well, a lack of consideration, shall I shall I say? That's the most charitable way I'm going to put it and I don't really want to rant and rave about this no. because we, we, we've done it it's clear that the ownership take a different view and their argument is well we priced it according to sort of supply and demand well they've got plenty of supply tomorrow evening and not a lot of demand because you're asking people to shell out £80 in the space of a few days in January, and the, there's no way Fulham are going to be able to play a totally full-strength team. I don't think I'm prepared to be proven wrong. Um, but at some point, the even that you stretch the loyalty of the most passionate, fanatical um, Fulham fan, because you wonder what you're getting for your uh, £40 when you can't, in the Hammersmith end, it's very difficult to get into the stand from the concourse. It's very difficult to get the refreshments. Uh, it's very it's very cramped inside the stand as well. And is it a pre is it a top quality match day experience? Well, no. Um, if you're judging it by sort of hospitality standards or even basic, you know what you'd expect. Um, and this is a way of registering your view about what's going on because um, you're, you're being asked to pay. And many years ago, these games were added to your, you know, you'd have to consent to it, obviously. But the club would you'd have a cup tie scheme, a home cup tie scheme, whereby Fulham did have a home 
Cup to ask you. And when you renewed your, uh, did have a home draw in the in the FA Cup or the League Cup, when you renewed your season ticket, there was a box that said, "Will you opt in?" And we'll just send the ticket. Now it's not hard to do. You can do that, and it just smacks of, you know, taking the fan base for granted. And I've had enough. And I know I'm not the only one judging by the ticket sales <laughs> for that game, which are, I mean, extraordinary. Uh, right. extraordinarily weak um, and I don't really know what to say anymore football has priced out a whole generation of people um, Fulham have now become the sort of poster child of ugly capitalism you know we 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 own, we own this club and basically you should pay because we need to find more money to buy more players and pass PSR well it shouldn't be the fans shouldn't have to balance the uh, books through their own hard-earned cash, and even if they charge them four thousand pounds a ticket, I'm not giving them any ideas here. No, um, please don't. It it wouldn't make the point is it wouldn't make a damn jot of difference to the bottom line. It just feels like supporters are becoming, you know, no figures on a spreadsheet and. At some point, you have to say, however much it pains you, at least I have to take a view that um, I'm not going to be uh, fleeced for it because they'll find someone else to sit in my seat um, eventually. They might not tomorrow. Well, they, 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 I don't even know where I would have would have sat. And it's the fact that it's on television, on yep. free television in this country. There aren't many of those games. So you can sit and watch it at home, and you know that I struggle with in the, in, in the cold weather anyway um, to get around, as most people know. So it's a big effort to get there. I make the effort every day. I crawl over broken glass to watch um, Tom Kearney and and a lot of these guys because I love the love the club. But you know, I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna pay through the nose when um, it doesn't feel my love for Fulham Football Club doesn't feel reciprocated, right? Fr frankly, and listen, I understand that, Dan. The, while you were talking, I was thinking about the way to talk about this, and this is the way I think they view it. It's like the movie Field of Dreams. If they build it, they will come. That's yes, what but they haven't. Like. But they haven't built it, Ross. This is the problem. I, I understand. They meant to build the Riverside Stand. Like, where is it? <laughs> Where is it? Right, they're meant to have finished it. Where is it? they haven't built it? I love that movie, but like, absolutely build it and they will come. But they're meant to build the Riverside stand and then they could finish building the house with then, right? And then, like, not finish it, just update it because we literally, as the back to the cottage campaign, said to Mohammed Al Fayed's people in a, in a meeting after a long and acrimonious campaign. You don't even have to spend that much money. Just bolt no. the seats onto the terraces and we can be back there next season. They did it and it's 20 years later and they haven't updated anything apart from just well, like secure it in. And the reason is because they said, well, we need to sort out the Riverside stand. And, you know, mugs like me, we said, oh, we understand. You know, that's a priority. But we didn't expect to sort of, be jammed in like sardines and treated with with, with disdain, right. you know, that, that's just not very Fulham. We should be no. better than this. No, Dan, and listen, uh, I do want to just get into this from my perspective a little bit. I'm glad that you brought that up. No, they have not built it, okay? But I was just using that as a talking point here, okay? You're laughing, but you will agree with me. What has upset me about this whole situation? And you just nailed it. I was going to say it, but you've already said it. They have not done the improvements to the rest of Craven Cottage that they need to do. And they have not finished the Riverside Sand. They, but they have this attitude, if they build it, meaning if they give you the match, they will come and they'll pay it. And I'm glad that some, like yourself, and maybe a lot, are making a stand here. And they should make a stand. You know how I feel about the owners right now. I'm not real huge fans of them because I don't feel that they're doing everything that they can for Fulham Football Club. I think they're doing what they feel that they need to do. 
Uh, but I don't think they're doing everything that they should be doing. And Craven Cottage is a perfect example of it. They now have this Riverside stand that's not done, but that's not the bigger issue. The bigger issue is the other stands. Why are you not improving that? And that has really upset me. But beyond that, get into what I'm saying is that they have this mentality is that if the match goes on, people will show up, people will pay, or they're going to get people in there. And I just do not like that mentality. They're not respecting really the people that make Fulham who they are. And that those are the supporters. We've talked about this. I don't see it. I just don't see it. I don't see enough respect to the Fulham supporters. And this situation with the tickets for Newcastle United actually screams of it. Because if they really cared, the ticket pricing wouldn't be where the, it is. They'd be thinking about, okay, here's an opportunity to give back a little bit. They're not doing that. They're going the other way. And that, to me, is what has upset me, Dan. And I want to give you praise and all the Fulham supporters who don't go because you're making a stand. We talk about it here in the U.S. If you really care about ticket prices, don't go. The Fulham supporters are going to do that for this Newcastle United match. And I'm there with them. I'm, I'm obviously not going to be there, but I'm backing them for that. I'm backing you, Dan, for taking your stand. Yeah, I think, I mean, not to, I'm always interested in balance as a, as, a, as a journalist. All I would say on the on the owners is part of the problem is that Shahi Khan has put in an awful lot of money. He has. An awful lot of money that he's never going to get back. Okay. So should that be admired or should we wonder why, what, what, why it is that he, he, he's done that? Um, and, Obviously, that's the cost of competing in the Premier League. But I do get frustrated with this argument because I say, oh, well, we've got to raise revenue. Well, yes, but there wouldn't be a Fulham football club at this point were it not for hard, for you know, very loyal Fulham supporters in much darker times, literally giving the club their money, literally giving the club their time literally campaigning and volunteering and painting parts of the ground, going in and cutting the grass free of charge, stewarding free of charge in the, in the, you know, when there, when there were barely any fans there and it, it, it just, but, but then that's my perspective as someone who grew up watching Fulham when they weren't very good, like, like genuinely, like, you know, I'm uh, trying to think of what the you'll you'll come up with an American analogy of <laughs> what I'm what I'm talking about here. But like, really, really, like, I don't know, Division Four style. I, I don't even know what the American equivalent in whatever sport. I was thinking yeah. of like really poor like college football, but even or high school football. But even then, don't you've got really good teams uh, yeah. at those levels. I, you know it, and it's slightly unfair, I guess, on the owners of the club currently because they don't have that, um, that that history, that law, that that um, that backstory. Um, but that's part of the problem. It right. shouldn't. It shouldn't take. We, we shouldn't have to ex fight and explain for this. We're not asking for the world because. The ticket prices won't make a difference. The idea that by putting an extra whatever you want on the ticket pricing is going to pay the wages of our new centre forward next season, or even if we manage to find one in the last week of the transfer, it doesn't look likely that we're going to make any signings, Russ. Um, yeah. By the way, you know it's not going to make a difference. So, yeah, I, I, I just feel very frustrated about this because as you know many of us have invested quite a lot of time in talking to Fulham over a long period of time not just about this but about a whole host of fans issues and it feels like it's been a bit of a waste of time um, and that's regrettable but what's pleasing me is you know people know they know the executives have to say what they have to say um, 
I, I don't really know why. They they could just be honest about it. But, you know, we have seen players, Tim Ream, Tom Kearney, Marco Silva, you know, people of former players, prominent people in the game saying that this is out of control. Um, and it's just a small way of saying uh, we, we can reorder our priorities. Tweak this just a little bit in, in this particular example and we'll get there because what they've said is, oh, well, we've cut the prices for children and and, and concessions. So, uh, and that's exactly what we said. Well, we need to not price out a generation of fans. So they're saying, oh, here, look, here you are for this game. You can go in for much cheaper if you've got kids and, uh, and whatever. But they spectacularly missed a point here because it's about just valuing your customers. Any business would do that. Okay, great stuff there, Dan. Thank you for sharing all that. To end the show, what are your thoughts on the match itself? Yeah, um, I think it's really interesting because it's sort of Newcastle's last throw of the dice for the season. Um, they'll probably they 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 could I I don't think they they may get into sort of Champions League through the league. I doubt it. They're probably going to get into the Europa League, maybe, but who knows? But in terms of winning something, this is their last go, and they'll be up for it. They need to end that run. We're the only team they've beaten in about eight or nine. I think it's eight games. Um, so look, the one thing I really want to happen, Russ, is for Fulham to keep. 11 players on the pitch for more than, <laughs> you know, the first 20 minutes or however long it is that Nathaniel Chalabar and, and Raul Jimenez between them in the last two games both did, quite frankly, astonishing uh, tackles and got sent off, didn't they? Both by VAR. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how much Marco Silva changes things. You've obviously got that Everton game on the horizon. Um, but I, I think he'll go pretty strong with a couple of alterations. I think we might see Tim Ream uh, return, uh, which will be very welcome. Good to good good to have Tim Ream back. And maybe an opportunity for uh, for a couple of other players to, to slot in and, uh, and stay the case. But um, hopefully we can record a rare victory over over Newcastle and we certainly owe them a good uh, a good victory and and hopefully the next time we talk um we can be on our way into the what fifth round of the uh, of the competition that'd be marvelous that'd be great Dan well listen I want to thank you so much for joining me today to talk about the uh, unfortunate ending to the Carabao Cup journey for Fulham and then talk a little bit about Newcastle. Please do check out Dan on hamian.com. I'm sure everyone already does. And listen to the wonderful podcast known as the Green Pole Podcast with Alan and Freddie Druitt. Please do check it out. It's wonderful. I would highly recommend it. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Cutter Talk. As always, please do subscribe on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. It does help other Fulham supporters find us. That's going to do it for this episode. My name is Russ Goldman. My guest today was Dan Crawford. Thank you as always for watching and listening to Cutters Talk, part of the TalkSport Fan Network.